I think it's very mixed, if I'm honest. I mean, what I've found in the work that I've done on procurement is not only is the industry fragmented in terms of lots of different suppliers, but it's also multi-layered. And so you have what I would say is the top 20 or 30 companies, um, and whether that's the contractors or the consultants, who are very well prepared, to be honest. They understand it, they understand the technology, they understand their supply chains. But when you get down to even level two, let alone levels three, four, five, and six, frankly, um, they're just looking for the next job. And, and the, there is very little preparedness, I would say. So, I mean, the work that I'm doing is all about balance, I suppose, and it, it, it's trying to bring to the attention of clients all the things that they actually need to balance when they're looking at a construction project. And what we found through the research is, is that it's not often a lack of desire, it's actually a lack of knowledge um, from clients. And so we think there's really two things that need to be done. We think that the um, sort of statute needs to be very, very crystal clear, because what most clients do is, is abide by the law. Um, but secondly, we also feel that the actual information that clients have available to them and the way that they can make these sort of value-based decisions is much easier that they can see the data, that they have clear information, that they have really, really clear figures in terms of not just um, the, the building project, but actually what it is they're building and how that will operate in use over 5, 10, 20, 100 years or whatever. So the COC has actually very recently published um, its, its um, climate statement, if you like, and is, is very, very supportive indeed of, of net zero. Um, I mean, the COC is made up of both government and obviously um, industry members. And, you know, at the end of the day, the government has put a, a, a legal commitment to, to net zero. I think everybody who sits around the COC table realises that essentially, it's not about 2050, it's about today, because of course every single building that we build in the next however many, 30 years, we hope will still be standing in 2050. So this isn't a future thing, this is a very current thing. So, you know, it's fair to say that coronavirus has, has rather overtaken the CLC in the last six months, but, but net zero is, is right up there on the agenda, and I think you will see much more of that in the next six months. So, I mean, I, I think there are some examples maybe from history in, in other areas. I mean, we, we are having exactly the same issue with um, professional indemnity insurance on um, cladding of high-rise residential buildings at the moment, irrespective of what the material is, quite frankly, now. Um, you know, and you'll find particularly architects who specialise in high-rise buildings, their professional indemnity insurance, um, their premiums have doubled or even trebled over the last three years. Um, you're, and, and what that means is that you are actually seeing um, people stepping away from certain um, markets completely. I don't mean the insurers, I mean the consultants and the contractors. Mm. Um, and so what you're finding is that it's becoming increasingly difficult to even commission a high-rise building because people don't want to pay the insurance that as designers. So what I actually think is that there will be a bit of market re-leveling actually because if you get clients want to build things but designers refuse to design them because they can't carry the liability uh, something has to give eventually and I think we will see um, a greater movement to things like whole project insurance so you know you, you get a combination of not just the professional indemnity you also get the building indemnity you might even get some building performance you might get construction performance there's all sorts of packages that can go into to sort of whole project insurance and this has been kicking around now for probably 20 years and there's not that many people that are advocating it because actually ultimately it brings the cost of insurance down so it's sort of like well the, the, you know again it is a personal view but the insurers probably aren't too keen on it um, but individual practitioners aren't that keen on it because they have to group together as well if you see what I mean but I, I think we're going to see a massive shake-up because it, it really is the, you know, what is it, the irresistible force and the immovable object. Something's going to have to give. 
And maybe one of the areas it will give first is actually in public procurement because of course if you're the MOD, you self-insure mm. um, and you, you, you actually have probably less of an interest in some of these problems than, than a big developer for example would or, or you know a big property holder. So I actually see that the government have a huge role to play in this because if they can build you know, portfolios of schools or MOD accommodation or prisons or whatever, and it's shown to be robust and environmentally sustainable and, and you know, has high social value, then others will, will, will follow, I would say. So I, I think it, there will be commercial pressure and I think there will be governmental pressure as well. Probably driven by the housing crisis, but actually the housing crisis is, is only one of the constituent parts. The government last year uh, made what I think was a really significant announcement, which was five key government departments um, have now been instructed that th when they're actually commissioning uh, construction works, they have to have what's called a presumption in favour of MMC. Now, it doesn't mean they actually have to use modern methods of construction. It means that they have to first look at modern methods of construction, and they then have to put forward um, a, 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 a definitive argument as to why they can't use it. So it's a sort of opt-out rather than an opt-in. Now what we have seen is that some departments are much keener on this than others it's fair to say. And to be fair the Department for Education are very keen on this. They, they see um, significant standardisation in MMC. They obviously build something like 200 new schools a year get built and some of the pushback that is often um, given to MMC, oh well everything looks the same and it's all really boring, um, A I don't believe but B even if it were true you never build two schools next to each other so actually this becomes completely irrelevant to them. Um, so, so certainly the Department for Education are very keen to progress it. Um, the Ministry of Justice are, are quite keen to pro progress it and so we are seeing this sort of trickle down from um, central government to um, the departments and then from the departments to the suppliers. Um, and so I think that over the next two or three years we will see a really significant growth in MMC. Again, the government are also funding um, the MMC development programme at the Construction Innovation Hub. Um, so that's got s considerable funding from the Transforming Construction Challenge Fund behind it, very much looking at what they call the platform approach. So this isn't looking at across the whole of MMC. MMC. It's saying how can we get standardised um, modules, if you like, so that then we can almost have a catalogue um, and, you know, the government departments can sort of, I mean, uh, Lego is a, is a little bit um, of an oversimplification, but that's almost the, the terminology they're using, that, you know, you, you have 10,000 component parts that could be made by a million suppliers and then you can build your building from those 10,000 yeah. components. So I think we will see, um, I, I, I think we've seen the initial acceleration. I think we're beyond the stage of that. I, th I think it, it is definitely growing by the day. And had it not have been for coronavirus, I think we would have seen this sooner actually. I mean, uh, th there's no two ways about it, there are different schools of thought in this and, and certainly some of the advocates of um, the, the platform approach um, aren't particularly talking about timber, but, and it's a huge but, um, we still have to look at the embodied carbon. And, you know, at the end of the day, if you're using steel framed MMC or indeed precast concrete planks, which are still MMC, then we're sort of forgetting about the embodied carbon. So from an RLB perspective, if we're looking at the holistic project, if we're looking not just at how you build it, but how you use it, indeed how you might even take it down eventually, then clearly timber has a massive role to play in this.
As a business, ROB has offices throughout Europe, and so we see many different construction techniques, many different procurement systems as well. And what has struck me for a long time is that the Northern European, particularly the Nordic countries, have been using timber since time immemorial. And I would say well over 50% of their buildings are already based on timber. So the French government's setting a target for 50% is clearly achievable in, in terms of using timber timber as, as the primary construction material. To be fair to the UK, I think that although we might have set targets differently, so our targets are in terms of MMC and the presumption in favour, I'm pretty sure that the UK government is expecting something in the order of 80% of public procurement to end up as, as a modern method of construction of some sort. And so timber must be up there. So really, I think that we will have similar targets in the UK.